Section 5 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Barbara Hale. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. Part 1 The Pearl Necklace, 1767. Chapter One. Goodbye, she said, and then again, goodbye. The voice of the young girl was choked with sobs, and tears rolled slowly down her cheeks. Goodbye, dear garden, goodbye, dear home. And as she spoke, she stopped and looked up at the old gray chateau, which the warm afternoon sun had made glow with tints of rose and gold. She made a pretty picture standing there, even though her eyes were red with weeping, for her clustering curls were drawn high on her graceful head with a great comb, the lack of powder letting their bright chestnut tones shine in the warm evening light. A gaily flowered gown of simple muslin, less ample in its cut than the style affected by those who live near the court, was fashioned so as to show a slender white throat. The delicate ruffles at elbow and neck showed that even in the country Mecklen, the lace of the hour had its wearers. Looking about, eyes even less partial than hers would cease to be surprised that parting with so fair a scene should cause such grief. To Clemence Vavier, the chateau was home. There she was born, had grown to girlhood, and though but seventeen, was not only a wife, but the mother of a tiny child, for whose sake she was preparing to leave parents, country, home, and friends, and seek that little known land across the sea, where so many of her countrymen had gained a footing in the wilderness. The pointed turrets of the chateau stood out sharply against the deep blue of the afternoon sky, and the glass panes in the small windows sparkled as the late sunbeams rested on them. On one side, huge vines of ivy clambered up the rough stones till they reached the roof, and amid their hospitable leaves sheltered many a nest of linnet and of sparrow, whose cheerful songs made music at morning and at sunset. Clement stood in the garden, looking sadly at the roses, whose sweet profusion was due in no small measure to her care. There was the garden seat, here the sundial, Yonder, above the wall, which bounded the garden, rose the dovecoat, around which constantly hovered some of her feathered pets. "'How can I leave you all?' she cried, as each familiar object rose before her eyes. "'My courage well nigh fails me,' and she sank on her knees before the dial. A gray veteran, which gave no hint of time this afternoon, since it marked only sunny hours, and already the long shadows cast by the chateau fell across its face of stone. Just at that moment, when she was almost willing to abandon the thought of the long and terrible journey, she heard a footstep on the gravel of the paths. Ah, Clement's dear heart, it grieves me, almost past endurance, to see your grief. Say but one word, and I will go forth alone, and shall send back for you and the little one when a home is made ready, and when I have some comforts for you. At the first sound of her husband's voice, Clemence had jumped to her feet, and running to him had laid her tear-stained face upon his shoulder. As he finished speaking, she had almost brought a smile to drive away the tears, and looking into his face, she bravely made answer. If it wrings my heart to leave dear France, Pierre, it would be a thousand times worse to have you go and leave me here me and little annette for whose sake we undertake all these perils if i could think that was really so and pierre scarce more than a youth himself as he yet wanted several months of seeing twenty years bore on his face a gravity that is rarely seen on one so young his dark eyes were sad and though he smiled when he comforted his youthful wife it seemed as though but to cheer her in truth all his life he had comforted and protected her, for Pierre Valvier, like Clemence, had called the old chateau, the rose garden, the long straight terrace, and the fertile fields his home. Left an orphan at an early age, 
under the guardianship of Monsieur Bienville, the father of Clemence, the two children had played together, studied together, and finally were wedded, and now were preparing to go forth to the new world together. At this time, Louis the Fifteenth sat upon the throne of France. He was a weak monarch, devoted to his pleasures, and content to let his ministers rule, although he always took an active part in all the religious quarrels which disturbed and agitated France. Jealousy, which had long been smoldering between France and England, on account of the various colonies in America to which each country laid claim, broke out into war in 1756, and its effects were felt over the whole world. The brilliant victory of Admiral Galassonier at Fort St. Philip, the chief citadel of Port Mahon, on the Minorca Islands, the most important naval victory which France had gained in fifty years, filled the whole French nation with joy. Yet the succeeding years brought little but ignominy and defeat, and the Seven Years' War, as this struggle was ultimately called, lost France not only the greater part of her navy, but, what was even more galling, many of her possessions in the New World. Disapproval of the king and his ministers drove to what was left of these colonies in America many Frenchmen of high character who foresaw nothing but disaster left for France herself. Among these was Pierre Valvier, who sought for himself and his little family a home in that new country where liberty of person and creed was assured. They were to start on the morrow for Calais and thence take ship for New Orleans. The old chateau, old even in 1756, stood upon a gentle slope, looking down upon the little fishing village of Atop. Such a tiny village it was, with its one-story huts. You could scarcely call them more. Set upon the banks of Canache, a broad, shallow river, so influenced by the ocean, that when the tide was low, the fisher girls kilted up their scant skirts, and waded across with their baskets of shrimps upon their strong young shoulders. Such a little village, and so poor. Pitty Sue, Pitty Sue, donne moi, ah, Pitty Sue. That was the cry heard on every side. There was hardly a hand in the hamlet which would not be held out in expectation of a small copper coin should any one from the chateau chance to pass through its one ill-paved street. Every year the poverty seemed to increase. Every year the revenues of the chateau grew less, which was but another reason why Pierre, a young and strong, should seek a home where those of gentle birth were made welcome and where the crown gave broad acres of land to each and all who would go and settle there. Still, even with hope and courage beckoning, the parting was sad for all. Monsieur Bienville, the father of Clemence, was a soldier of the old regime, tall, elegant, with the true air of grandeur, which is born, not bred. He watched with sad eyes the preparation for departure. Madame, his wife, could not suppress her grief, and declared that never, never again should she see her loved ones. Ah, she cried, the poor children will be devoured by frightful beasts, I know it well, if not by those that roam on land, by those more awful ones which dwell in the sea. The distant land was to her a wilderness, a desert, and in truth, a few miles away from the city of New Orleans, it was little else. Chapter 2 The rain was falling heavily as the old traveling carriage, drawn by four horses, lumbered up to the door of the chateau the next morning. Into it had been packed the necessaries for the journey to Calais, and two heavy wains had been sent off some days previously, laden with such goods as the young people were to take with them to the new world. Within doors, the daughter was taking leave of her parents, and as if to shorten the sad moment, her father took her hand and placed within it a packet carefully bound in silk. Dear daughter, said he, see that this packet is carefully guarded. In it is thy inheritance, the pearl necklace, which my mother had from her mother, and which in its turn must go to thy daughter, the little Annette. Oh, father, why give to me that most precious thing? 
safeguard it till we come again as if god is willing we shall it is yours and then the daughter's and he whispered in her ear i have added all the jewels which were my mother's portion keep them till time of need the impatient stamping of the horses on the cobblestones of the court warned them all that they must part and pierre led clemence to the carriage where little annette was sleeping on the broad lap of old marie who had petted and scolded her mother through her babyhood and was now going with her on that long journey to the land of which they knew so little and feared so much as if desirous of making up for lost time jacques cracked his whip and with the words farewell farewell ringing in the ear the coach passed quickly down the long drive and through the gates leading to the high road and in turn the direction of Bolognay, where they were to pass that night as if desirous of making up for lost time jacques cracked his whip and with the words farewell farewell ringing in the air the coach passed quickly down the long drive and through the gates leading to the high road and turned in the direction of Bolognay, where they were to pass that night the familiar scenes of her childhood never seemed so fair to clemence as at this moment when she was parting from them here was the little church nestling among the trees where she had received her first communion and there stood pere joseph waving adieu from the old gray porch the familiar tear stealing down his wrinkled cheek here was the little church nestling among the trees where she had received her first communion and there stood pere joseph waving adieu from the old gray porch the unfamiliar tear stealing down his wrinkled cheek farther along on the other side of the road was the rose d'or the quaint old inn before whose hospitable door the village yokels were wont to gather of a summer's evening and play at bowls under the green the very signboard as it hung above the door and swung in the wind seemed to creak farewell and as the travelling chariot rolled by clemence hid her face upon her husband's shoulder at last her sobs grew less violent and as if to call attention from her grief little annette awoke and lying comfortable and rosy upon the lap of her nurse cooed out her satisfaction as only a healthy happy baby can pierre took the child in his arms and the baby stretched out her hands towards her mother who turning to take her found neglected in her own lap the parcel of jewels so carefully wrapped and handed to her by her father as a parting gift see pierre my father gave to me the pearl necklace which i wore on my wedding day and it is to be the portion of little annette when she too marries hardly had the words passed her lips when rude shouts were heard and the coach gradually came to a standstill halt cried a voice almost beside the window and old jacques the coachman could be heard saying but messieurs my master mistress please knave let thy betters speak for themselves at this a rude leering face was thrust into the window and a man pulled roughly at the carriage door and cried step out and quickly too and bring out your valuables with you but we are travellers and have with us barely enough to carry us to calais where our ship lies at anchor said pierre trying not to let his voice show anger and disgust what will serve you will serve us also at a pinch is it not so jean and as he turned to a third ruffian who stood at hand holding by the bridle some sorry-looking horses truth if we take all they have twill be enough but do not wait too long answered the one named jean who wore a soldier's cap with a soiled and broken feather trailing over one ear at the first appearance of the highwayman at the carriage window clemence had handed little annette to marie and in so doing had managed to slip among her clothes the precious packet of jewels she gave marie a warning look and when they were commanded to step from the coach she begged for the sake of the child that it and the nurse might sit within you can see for yourselves that neither the infant nor the aged woman has aught of value said she after hurriedly searching through the coach and finding nothing more the highwaymen contented themselves with carrying off pierre's sword and a fair pearl ring which clemence wore upon her finger and a small bag of golden doubloons which pierre had in the pocket of his travelling coat 
the villainous trio had scarcely got safely away when the reason of their haste became apparent for a captain and four men-at-arms came around a turn in the road urging their horses to a smart trot when they saw the travelling carriage drawn up by the side of the ditch have three renegades passed this way called the leader as they drew rein truly but a few moments since said pierre with a rueful face as he thought of his bag of gold it would have pleased me much had you come this way but a few moments earlier since i then had been the richer for a purse of doubloons stole they aught beside asked the captain as he put spurs to his horse and hardly waited for pierre's answer as they rode hastily away in the direction the robbers had taken when once more the coach was in motion clemence turned to annette and clasped her in her arms saying of a truth little one twas fortunate indeed that you saved your inheritance this time you and marie let us hide the packet better madame said marie who can tell when another band of cutthroats may be upon us and truly as thou sayest it was but chance that saved us this time without delay the packet was carefully tied among the long skirts of little annette and marie had hardly ceased to tremble till the coach rolled into the yard of the inn at boulonnais and the red light streaming from the open door showed them that warmth and shelter were to be had within early astir the next morning refreshed and cheered because the rain had ceased and the sun shone cheerfully abroad our travellers during the late afternoon of the next day entered the grey old town of calais the little annette unconsciously guarding the packet which held her inheritance as well as the jewels which monsieur bienville had given as a parting token to his daughter it was quite dark when the carriage was at last unpacked and not till then did pierre draw from behind a secret panel in the side of the coach the store of gold which was to suffice for their needs on board ship until they were established in the new home which awaited them on the other side of the ocean end of section five section six of deeds of daring done by girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sarah brady deeds of daring done by girls by hannah moore the pearl necklace part two sections three and four in the harbour of calais rode at anchor the ship esperance which was taking on passengers and their goods for the long voyage to new orleans owing to the shallow water the ship could not approach the quay and all the watermen of the town were busy carrying back and forth those who like our travellers were outward bound or those who came merely to say a last farewell on the walls of the town were gathered a motley crew who not having friends on board sought to gain some excitement by watching the partings of others and as from time to time the chimes rang out from the belfry behind the citadel the little craft in the harbour became even more animated since they now carried out to the espérance some who had been belated on their way thither and sought to get themselves and their goods safely aboard before the turn of the tide should serve to carry the ship out through the straits into the english channel watching this scene from the cramped deck of the ship clemence and pierre stood together the former giving free vent to her tears which rolled unheeded down her cheeks at the thought that she was leaving behind her so much which had hitherto made her life joyful her sadness was reflected in her husband's face and at last he spoke dear wife tis not yet too late to return say one word and i can call one of those dinghies which shall carry us back to shore nay pierre i would go with you but indeed i must weep since never again do these eyes expect to look on my beautiful france i pray your sacrifice may not cost too dear said pierre pressing her hand and as she wept she whispered the grief i feel at parting from france is not compared to what i should feel at parting from you even as she spoke there began such a scene of bustle and confusion that clemence perforce dried her eyes to gaze upon it the sailors were running to and fro stowing the goods of passengers away and piled on the deck were feather beds and pallets of straw each passenger providing such beds and covering as his station in life permitted since the ship provided only the room in which these might be laid boatloads of people were leaving the ship 
some merry, some grave, and above all the noise rose the sharp commands of the captain. At last sounded the shrill notes of the boatswain's whistle, and the crew began to man the capstan bars. One of the sailors commenced to sing to ease the labour off a bit, and at the sound of the well-known chorus, Ho, ho, betelie, betelie, tire, tire, entre de flots, tire, roger, tire, noté. The crew joined in, so that the bars worked like magic, and the anchor rose into sight, then came short up, and finally, with another drive of the bars, swung all wet and dripping at the bows. Ere this the huge sails had been bent into place, and now, with the fresh evening breeze, began to draw, while from every side came the curious creak and tugging noise which is present in every sailing craft. It was not many moments ere the Esperance and her nose pointed seaward, and was bowling along with the white foam flying in her wake. All too quickly the shores and buildings of the town receded from the sight of those who gazed on them with tears, and even the belfry chimes had a melancholy sound as they floated out over the water. Pierre and Clemence stood by the rail, rather apart from the other passengers, and when the purple twilight had swallowed up France, Pierre said, See, Clemence, a good omen. Look at the new moon. It is a happy sign, and glad am I to see it. How silvery it looks, and see the horn dips not at all, which argues well for a smooth voyage. Though the Espérance was not a swift craft, she was a steady one. There were three weary months spent on board of her, and the moon proved a false prophet, since they encountered storms and headwinds, and in addition had the alarm of pirates and the heat of the tropics. Worse even than the perils of the Atlantic were those encountered when they entered the Gulf of Mexico, where also pirates lay in wait, where there were contrary currents, and worse than all, sandbars, upon which the ship grounded. Many manoeuvres were tried to ease her off, and there was despair felt on all sides when it was ordered that the baggage should be thrown overboard. Fortunately, this sacrifice became unnecessary as the second high tide floated her off, and slowly the Espérance glided into deeper water. Pierre and Clemence heard with joy the rattle of the chain as the anchor was thrown overboard in the harbour of the Belize, thinking, poor souls, that the sufferings of the journey were over. Clemence turned with a bright smile to poor Marie, who sat upon a pile of bedding which lay on the deck, where it had been thrown in order to be ready for the departure from the ship. The old nurse had suffered greatly during the long, tedious journey, and even now she looked sad and worn as she sat there in the sunshine, holding little Annette on her knees. Come, Marie, look less sad. Soon we will reach the spot where our home is to be. Let me hold the little one. Oh, madame, little did I know of the horrors before us. Praise God that we still live, we and the little cat. Truly, the little cat and Annette seem to have fared better than the rest of us, said Clemence, laughing. Let us hope there will be fewer mice than you expect. But, madame, a cat is so comfortable, and in this wild land there will be few enough comforts, I well know. Just at this moment, Pierre hurried up to them and said, Come, Clemence, bring Annette while Marie helps me, for the captain says we are to go ashore and wait at the house of the commandant till boats come for us from New Orleans. It was with scant ceremony that our little party and some of the other passengers were packed into the ship's boats and then taken to Dauphin Island. Here they were made comfortable, and during the week of their stay recovered somewhat from the sufferings on shipboard. It was in two pirogues and two barges that they at last started on the trip up the river to New Orleans, and for discomfort the seven days passed in this journey far outdid all the fatigue sustained in the Esperance. Oh, madame, said Marie, whoever saw mesures les maringouins of such size and with such stings before? and as she spoke she waved again the huge fan with which she tried to protect Annette from the ravages of the mosquitoes. An hour before sunset, the rowers stopped each day, and the whole party encamped on shore so as to get safely tucked in beneath the mosquito bars before les mesures should begin operations. If the nights were dreadful, the days were scarcely better, since the boats were piled high with goods so that the passengers were cramped in narrow spaces and hardly dared to move. In fact, the little cat in its wicker basket, and Annette, carried on the broad breast of Marie, were the most comfortable members of the party. They had no fears of going to feed the fishes, as had some of their elders. At length, the weary trip was over, and when at length the boats drew up at the landing, much of the discomfort was forgotten. 
the crescent city lay before them the white-walled houses gleaming in the sunshine while the bells of the ursuline convent pealed a welcome and there burned before the chapel of our lady of prompt succour votive candles to commemorate the safe arrival of another band of travellers from the distant land which every one in his heart called home pierre cried clemence surprise showing in every tone of her clear voice but what a beautiful city and oh pierre behold the lovely ladies scarce ever in my life have i seen such brave apparel her eyes were fixed as she spoke on a group which idly came down towards the landing the ladies elegant in robes of damask silk loaded with lace and ribbons while beside them lounged officers in rich court suits both men and women wearing powdered hair and having their faces decorated with black patches louisiana was passing through an interesting period of its growth a changing from the pioneer days when the young officers from canadian forts came down and made things lively with their merry pranks and boyish larks their ceremonies and festivals the marquis de vaudreuil was governor now and brought with him the elegances and dignity which he had learned in years of life at the french court the french and swiss officers but newly arrived bore also the stamp of continental training and the house of the marquis reflecting as well as might be the elegance of versailles was the centre of all that was most refined in the city tradition chatters yet of the gracious manners of the marquis and there are still drawn from chests and carved presses robes which once figured at his balls when court dress was the only wear though these gowns are now faded and tarnished in the time when they were first worn they flaunted brilliant flowers on a ground of gold the yellow bits of lace at elbow and corsage are frail now as a spider's web but then they were the latest patterns of alençon and flanders and fit companions for the jewels which sparkled amongst them it was at this time when new orleans boasted the greatest beauty and elegance of any city in the new world that our little family landed on its quay it is hard to conceive that while within the limits of the city there flowed such gay life as that seen in the governor's mansion without and but a few miles away were untrod wildernesses but so it was pierre and clemence rested but a few days before they sought out the plantation where they so fondly hoped to raise a home and enjoy the fruits of the rich country which they had chosen as their own the roads were poor horses high in price and not at all plenty so that pierre bought some pirogues a species of small boat to take them and their goods the twenty miles up the bayou gentilly to where their plantation lay poor clemence how gloomy looked the cypress swamps which stretched away on either hand as the heavily laden boats moved slowly along strange and unfamiliar were the long curtains of grey moss which swung back and forth from the branches of the trees seeming to wave in a ghostly fashion even when there was no wind and creeping up to the tops of the tallest trees in its silent fashion but ever turning aside from the bunches of mistletoe which stood out great rosettes of bright green where all else seemed marked for decay even the brilliant-hued birds which flitted cheerfully from one twig to another and sang from time to time did not cheer her for they seemed so unfamiliar her mind clinging more to those modest coated friends the linnets and finches which she had fed in the rose garden at the chateau at Etaples. ever anxious to cheer her pierre said at last sing dearest clemence it seems so long since i heard your voice how can i sing when my heart is sad but even as she spoke she was sorry since she knew that the good spirits of the little party depended largely on herself what shall i sing pierre she asked after a moment's pause and then as if it had been on the tip of her tongue all the while began chante rosine chante trois car la coeur tangue pour moi je ne l'ai que mon amant m'a quitté pour un bouton de rose que trop tôt j'ai donné je voudrais que la rose fût encore au rosier et que la rose y ait même fût encore à planter et que mon ami pierre fût encore à m'aimer ta la 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 ta la la de la rira 
no doubt it was the mockingbird song which rang from the trees which brought to the mind of clemence the song which had been a favourite of theirs at home and which told so musically of the nightingale's song of the red of the rose and of the love of pierre in five minutes the scene seemed to change from gloom to gaiety annette was cooing marie kept time to the gay little tune with the great fan which seldom left her hand while the little cat in her efforts to gain her freedom tipped over the basket and set them all laughing the bayou gentilly up which they were travelling in the pirogues which were hardly more than dug-out canoes was bordered at intervals on either side by the plantations of settlers who had owned the land for fifty years and over in some cases why pierre how is this said clemence breaking off her song first the wilderness then see the fields are planted these plantations are worked by the order of the king answered pierre and the little shrubs with berries which have such fresh green leaves are the myrtle wax bushes from which wax for candles is made we ourselves will have our plantation bordering on the bayou set with such bushes as these it is so directed but i thought indigo and sugar cane were what we were to plant i know that i could not bring half the things i wished lest there should not be room for the indigo seeds and the little canes pierre smiled and said truly a house dear girl is the first thing to be considered and that may best be obtained by a good crop of indigo seed since the planters hereabouts must needs get their seed from france unless some are willing to raise seed only on the forenoon of the second day the boats drew up to the shore and pierre anxious but looking cheerful said welcome to your new home clemence give me the little annette marie since she with her mother must be the first to step on shore home you say pierre and clemence laughed and looked ruefully too at the little log cabin which had been hastily built by the negro sent on in advance by pierre patience but for a little while and in place of that rude home you shall see a house as fair as any in these plantations laughing like two children the young parents hastened to touch to the ground one of annette's tiny feet cased in its sandal and as monsieur valvier handed the child back to its mother he said what is that which makes the child's garment so stiff a warning glance from clemence and a smothered exclamation from marie made him remember that it was the precious packet with the pearl necklace and jewels of which the little girl was still the unconscious custodian in new orleans indeed they had been forced to draw on the packet since it was necessary to have slaves to help them build and plant and though there were frequent importations of them from africa the value of one working slave was equal to a thousand dollars of our money and while it was generally paid in rice pierre a newcomer was obliged to pay in money in order to do this and also buy the precious seed which was so necessary his own store was more than exhausted and but for the packet so thoughtfully provided by monsieur bienville they would have been obliged to start out ill provided four although the log cabin was far different from the old chateau and the garden planted with indigo and young sugar canes a great contrast to the rose garden with its sundial at etaples the young couple were not unhappy and little annette grew apace the only person who took the change sadly to heart was old marie and her love for her mistress and the little one was all that kept her alive the fertile soil so rich on the shores of the bayou that it was fairly black was soon heavily planted there were rice fields in addition to those of indigo and sugar cane and for the home were planted watermelons potatoes peas and beans figs and bananas as well as pumpkins were abundant and there were wild grapes and pecans to be had for the gathering with a gun the larder could be kept supplied with ducks geese wild swan venison pheasants and partridges and most curious of all wild beef for unbranded cattle were considered common property and many of them escaped from the ranges and roamed the forests in increasing companies the second year the plantation showed the results of monsieur valvier's unceasing care and he carried to new orleans a crop of indigo seed which exceeded by many bushels his greatest hopes as the slaves pushed off from the landing pierre standing in the stern of the boat called out what shall i bring thee back clemence whatever you think i shall like best she answered waving her hand in farewell what for the little daughter and as if she had only been waiting for the chance annette called out gaily dolly how shall i get a dolly 
Would you not rather have something else, a toy or a new frock? No, Papa, a dolly. And Annette pressed in her arms the bit of stick envelope in a piece of gay calico which served as her substitute for the dearest of all toys. Two days later, when the little girl was helping her mother to gather the wax berries from the twigs so that the yearly supply of candles might be made, they heard from the bayou the cheerful song of the negroes as they rode homeward. Come, Mamma! Oh, come and see my dolly! And Annette ran away, while her mother followed more slowly, talking to old Marie, who was carrying in her arms a young Pierre, Annette's little brother, who had been born since they had lived in the new home. With a pleased face, Monsieur Valvier leaped ashore, hardly waiting for the boat to reach the landing. In his arms he held two parcels carefully wrapped in silver paper. Now Mamma shall guess first what is in her parcel, he said. But Annette could not wait for that, and stood close at his side, saying over softly to herself, My dolly! My pretty, pretty dolly! Give Annette hers first, said Madame Valvier. It will take me much time to guess what my parcel contains. Annette sat soberly down and brought forth from many wrappings a beautiful doll, with red cheeks and blue eyes, dressed like a court lady, and newly come from France, as her father explained. She is most too beautiful to love, exclaimed the little girl, as she gently held the gay lady, and the father and mother could only smile at the serious face of the child as she regarded the doll she had so fondly desired. Now look at your gift, dear wife. I hope it will please you as much as Annette's pleases her. And Monsieur Valvier put into his wife's hands the second packet. With almost as much excitement as Annette, her mother unrolled her gift and exclaimed with pleasure at the length of shining silk which greeted her delighted eyes. Oh, but Pierre, she began, but he stopped her with, Yes, I know what you would say, silks and a log cabin, but I have good news. The indigo seed brought such a high price that I have bought all that was needed for a house, and already it is loaded on barges and on its way hither. Good news indeed, that is. Marie, did you hear that we are to have a house at last? Who knows? Perhaps it may be ready for the little Pierre's christening. The parish in which lay the Valvier's plantation also contained the homes of several other planters. These were either earlier settlers or blessed with greater riches than the Valvier, and their plantations were dignified with dwellings which seemed commodious enough in these days, simple as they would appear in our eyes now. The planters' homes were often built in what was called the Italian style, with pillars supporting the galleries which were in reality roomy piazzas. The houses were surrounded by gardens of gorgeous flowering plants and approached by avenues of wild orange trees. It was such a house which soon rose on the bank of the Bayou Gentilly, among the trees which flourished in that teeming soil, and the rude cabin was moved to the background to serve as the quarters for the slaves. Nor were their gaieties wanting, for the planters visited among their neighbours the ladies coming in huge lumbering coaches drawn by many horses or by pirogue, while the men almost always rode, the saddle-horse for the master being almost a necessity. The succeeding years passed quickly, if not too prosperously, and tobacco was added to the productions of the Valvier plantation. Pierre had made himself honoured and respected among the men in his own and the neighbouring parishes, and his ardent love for France kept him ever a Frenchman, even though his home lay across the sea. Annette was by this time eight years old, quite a little mother, as Clemence fondly called her. Since grave beyond her years, she looked out for the little brothers and sister who had been born at the Bayou Gentilly. Poor Marie had died, a victim to an attack of the fever, which hangs like a dark pall over that enchanting region. And more care had fallen on the shoulders of little Annette than really belonged there. She saw not only to the welfare of the children, but ruled the blacks and looked after the house in a fashion which astonished her mother, whose health had sadly failed and upon whose natural energy the relaxing climate had laid its enervating spell. The French thrift, which is so marked a quality in the women of that nation, seemed to have passed by the mother, and bloomed in the nature of the daughter, and in its efforts were all which kept the home from being better than a cabin, left to the mercies of the negligent slaves. End of section 6 Recording by Sarah Brady Section 7 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Hale. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. Part 3. The Pearl Necklace. Chapter 5. There was one thing for which Annette's mother never lacked strength or energy, and that was the celebration of the birthdays, fate days, she called them, of the little family. There was always some little gift forthcoming, were it only a basket of fine figs or a garland of flowers, and for Annette particularly, her mother always made an extra effort. The birthday of the little girl fell in June, that month when all the world is dressed in flowers, and when the sky above seems to bend its bluest arch. On this occasion, Annette was to have a party, her very first, and all the children from the neighboring plantations had been bidden, and Papa had made a special trip to New Orleans and come home with some wonderful and mysterious packages, which had been quickly hidden away. At last the day arrived, and Annette felt it to be the happiest one she had ever known. To be nine years old and to have a party, just think of that, August, she cried as she helped the little boy to dress. August was thinking of it with so much glee that it made the dressing of him more than usually difficult, and Annette turned to little Pierre. But his whole attention was given to keeping a secret, for Mamma had said that Annette was not to know what her present was to be till they were all gathered at the table for breakfast. But he knew, did little Pierre, and it was a hard burden not to tell Sister Annette. At last the little ones were ready, and Annette had seen that the simple fare, which formed the breakfast, fruit and hominy, with coffee for the father and mother, was on the table. Such a clamor as arose. Oh, mother, let me tell. No, let me. Oh, Sister Annette. But they got no further, for Annette herself pulled the cover off a big box which laid on her chair, and there within lay a white dress, oh, such a pretty one, and a little pair of slippers with long, narrow ribbons to lace them crisscross about the ankles, and most lovely of all, a long blue sash which had on its two ends a fringe of gold. Oh, dearest mother, cried Annette, was there ever anything so lovely? And the little broad queen's pointing to the little slippers, and a fan. Oh, mother, and you too, father, how can I thank you both enough? Her father kissed her fondly and said, My little daughter repays me every day. The mother was well contented with Annette's pleasures for all the pains she had taken. And, Sister Annette, see, I gave you the fan. And, oh, sister, look at the pretty mouchoir that is from me. And the happy Annette kissed and thanked, and they were all so pleased that breakfast was quite forgotten, and would have grown cold if Black Mimi had not put her head in at the door to remind them of it. When Annette had put on the new birthday dress, laced the slippers around her slender ankles, and held the fan and kerchief, she ran into her mother's room to show her the effect. See, Mama, it just fits me. And she gave the small skirts a toss and a pat while her mother turned from the table where she had been standing with a small casket in her hand. Dearest Annette, said she in quite a solemn voice, I shall let you wear today what my father gave to me, saying that one day it was to be thine. When you are grown to be a big girl, it shall be yours to have always, but today you shall wear it because you are my good child and I love you fondly. As Madame Valvier spoke, she clasped about Annette's neck the pearl necklace, the one remnant of the packet of jewels which had come from France and which had been drawn on when crops failed or for the purchase of slaves or for some of the many needs in a new country where money is scarce. Oh, Mama, and Annette's voice was low with pleasure as she gently touched the rows of shining pearls which seemed far too costly a jewel for the neck of a little girl, and quite out of place over the modest frock. Are these really for me some day? Did Grandpere say it should be so? 
and annette listened while her mother told her of her grandfather's injunction and how old marie had hidden them in annette's own clothes and saved them from the highwaymen the time passed quickly before the little guests began to arrive for it was to be an afternoon party and some were brought by boat on the bayou while others rode on pillions behind black philippe or jean as the case might be sitting very still so that the best frocks would not be rumpled many games they played in the long cool galleries or on the grass before the house ball was one of them and when they were tired of this they played at hide-and-seek finding many a good and secret nooks among the trees and wax myrtle shrubs which were so bushy and so green what shall we play next asked annette anxious that her guests should have a good time and someone suggested hugh sweet hugh that game of many verses which has been played high and low through so many centuries and all countries the children made a pretty sight as circling in a ring they sang merrily come up sweet hugh come up dear hugh come up and get the ball i will not come i may not come without my bonny boys all even after the tragic death of sweet hugh their voices rang out clearly till the last verse and all the bells of merry france without men's hands were rung and all the books of merry france were read without men's tongue never was such a burial since adam's days begun then half frightened at their own game they scampered into the house where madame valvier was awaiting them and were spread on the trestle boards were all the dainties so loved of children fresh figs with cream sweet chocolate little cakes made of nuts and honey and right in the centre a great round birthday cake with a dove on the very top at this last touch annette was as much surprised as the other children and in answer to her wondering look her mother said your father brought it from new orleans it is his gift to you after it had been admired annette cut the first piece and the merry meal seemed over all too quickly for the children who had to take their way homewards reluctant to have an end put to such unusual festivities and not half aware of the necessity of being safe in their own homes before nightfall when the last one had gone annette took off her unaccustomed finery and holding in her hands the splendid necklace looked with wonder on the round globes of pearls which showed on their satiny faces the shifting tones of rose blue pale green and yellow ah mother she sighed to think that so beautiful a thing should be mine remember always little daughter that it was first my mother's portion then mine and shall be yours never to part with of a truth dear mother i should wish to keep it always but and here she hesitated you know the other jewels which grandpere gave have all gone those were my own but this is different and should be kept always except in case of gravest need gravest need what is that mamma and annette's blue eyes looked up solemnly into her mother's face does it mean to save a life mamma madame valvier hardly appreciating the earnest little soul which was listening to her words answered yes to save a life or honor now put it in its box and come with me till i show you where it is hidden in a small room where the children kept their few playthings some rude toys some bright shells and beans madame valvier paused and stooping took from beneath the window a small board which disclosed a box-like cupboard lined with lead here it is kept with the rest of our treasures annette the papers which belong to your father and the grants of our land i show you this place because you have a wisdom beyond your years and are indeed my little comfort annette's face grew rosy with pleasure at these words and holding her mother's hand she whispered i love you truly dearest mamma and i am the happiest girl in the world when the little ones were in bed annette crept up on her father's lap and had the crowning joy of the day a long story of his childhood's days in france and she listened entranced as she had hundreds of times 
to his descriptions of the old grey chateau at etaps the rose garden with its sundial and best of all to the tales of how he and her mother used to scull down the broad shallow canache and then at the river's mouth search among the rocks and seaweed for shrimps while out at sea the big ships went sailing past with their white or brown sails swelling with the fresh wind even with the interest she felt in the story poor annette tired with so much pleasure nestled lower and lower in her father's arms and finally her head fell on his shoulder she sleeps he said poor little girl fairly tired out with too much happiness and taking her in his strong arms he carried her off to her room where she was soon settled in her bed the process of undressing hardly waking her chapter six with each succeeding year there were more and more settlers coming to the flowery land of louisiana if they had flocked thither in the time of the regent that clever and witty intriguer they came more eagerly during the reign of louis the fifteenth so shallow a king that it is hard to conceive how he won the name of the well-beloved it was a strange company which made up the population of the crescent city not only those from paris with their elegances and velvet coats beneath which beat such loyal hearts but rubbing shoulders with them in street and cafe were many a far rougher exterior who had come down from the settlements in canada and learned to adore the little city which was so different from the homes which they had left in the cold north yet each and every one of these marquises from france or pioneer from canada or even the sad-faced acadian refugee who had been welcomed to these hospitable shores had a heart which beat for france alone with but the least assistance they would have swept the gulf and made themselves masters of that inland sea and not only held the possessions of the mother country on land but added to them frenchmen in language and in their hearts they put up with the expulsion of the beloved ursuline sisters since the mother country so willed it only allowing themselves the liberty of giving vent to their feelings by indulging in such unlimited number of satirical songs burlesques and pasquadades as they were called little did they know as they trod the white streets of the city the deadly blow to those same stout hearts which france was plotting france whom they loved so fondly and whom they trusted so implicitly completely dominated by his prime minister choizamba louis the fifteenth followed where this ugly brilliant and constant man led and trafficked first with austria and then with spain till in seventeen sixty one choizamba put in shape his famous pacte de fame which united all the royalties of bourbon blood and which formed into one great band the thrones of france spain turin naples and sicily although choizamba had the audacity to frame this agreement and louis the fifteenth had the folly to sign it they did not have the courage to proclaim it and so it remained a secret for several years it was not till october seventeen sixty four that the news arrived at new orleans that louisiana had by secret treaty been ceded to spain and instructions were to send monsieur d'abadi the governor to hand over to the envoy of spain who would shortly arrive the whole colony in its possessions the blow was stunning at first it could not be credited to be tossed like a plaything from france to spain that cowardly spain who had never assisted them in any way who had not even fought to get them whom they had outwitted and overmatched in every contest this was too much not many hours elapsed before the city was in a ferment groups gathered on the street corners and loudly denounced the proceedings the wine shops had excited bands who declaimed in passionate language against both king and country that could treat a colony in such fashion and the chorus which rose and swelled protested that it could not be borne swift pirogues carried the news among the plantations which lay along the bayous while men on horseback went to those in the interior 
meetings were called in the parishes first and then a convention was planned in new orleans itself to which every parish in the state was to send delegates the subject was to be discussed and then the king was to be informed of this cruel this awful thing that he was doing and he was to be petitioned to listen to the voice which echoed his own tongue and which under every trial had spoken but loyal words of him every parish sent its most notable men and of these monsieur valvier annette's father was one the meeting at new orleans was a gathering of all that was wise and distinguished throughout the whole state and it was unanimously decided to send to france a delegation of three men to bear to the king himself their petition these three men left for france on the first vessel which sailed and one can imagine the passionate nature of the appeal which they carried with them and which the whole colony besought the king to let them die as they had lived frenchmen to their heart's core think of the feeling of relief which swelled every heart as the crowds gathered to see the envoys depart bearing the message to france and to their king not one doubted but that the eloquence of jean Mahat, who headed it would win back their loved state from the hated spaniard and that he would speedily return with the joyful news and that once more it would be french land for french men to the doors of france are laid many acts of cruelty and oppression but there is no sadder story than the grief and humiliation to which this little delegation was subjected for one whole year they waited were put off from day to day with first one excuse and then another and at last sick and heartbroken sailed back to new orleans without ever having seen the king nor presented their petition even though their chief envoy did not return and there was no news of the success of their petition the people of louisiana seemed to have no doubt as to its success judge then of the fever of excitement into which they were thrown when her letter arrived in july seventeen sixty six saying that don antonio de jara the spanish envoy was on his way to take possession what should be done whither should they turn new meetings were called the militia was strengthened as much as possible but month after month passed away and don antonio did not arrive so that the people quieted down and hope bubbled up afresh one morning in february seventeen sixty seven when the commandant awoke he found anchored below the belize that old fortress at the mouth of the river a large frigate flying the spanish colors on board was don antonio with his personal suite two companies of spanish infantry and some capuchin monks in march in a frightful storm of wind and rain they landed on the levee in new orleans and were met by a sullen crowd of citizens and by a mass of unwilling french troops the spanish envoy haughty severe in aspect and a martinet in demanding that differential ceremonial etiquette which was so firmly engrafted into spanish nature either could not or would not understand the feelings which prompted the ardent louisianians to cling to their nationality he expected the people to change at his coming their flag and their allegiance the soldiers their service and all to hasten to assume the spanish yoke he could not understand their refusal to do so and when the superior consul of the city requested him to show his credentials he abruptly refused although he agreed to defer taking possession till more spanish soldiers were sent to him this was at least the form to which he agreed but he proceeded to get control as far as possible visiting in turn all the military posts and replacing the french flag and the french commanders with spanish ones over new orleans only did the french flag still wave it may be easily understood that such high-handed deeds were not accomplished without protest on the part of the people of louisiana curtailed of their possessions on every side for by the treaty of paris much had been ceded to the english they proposed to make as stubborn a resistance as possible in the remote parishes the feeling flamed almost higher than at new orleans itself 
since the sight of the detested spanish flag was an ever-present insult during the year which had been passed since the deputation had been sent to paris bearing the memorial to the king monsieur valvier had wasted neither time nor effort to arouse those with whom he came in contact and keep them rigorously opposed to spanish rule there were stormy meetings in the parish to where he belonged in which he was always an impassioned leader there were secret meetings at his and the neighboring plantations he became gloomy a man with but one thought in his head the disgrace of belonging to spain it was small wonder that with its head so distraught the plantation fell into neglect the crops of indigo and tobacco failed since the master's eye no longer kept watch on careless servants madame valvier's ill health increased as the winter season approached and on little annette fell more and more the care of the family and home scant crops made scant money and it was only by unceasing care that annette kept the active little brothers clothed and fed and saw that the languid mother had her fresh fruit and café au lait and that her favorite gowns of delicate white were kept mended and ever fresh nor were these all her duties at evening when her father returned depressed and miserable from a never-ending discussion with neighboring planters as to the ignominy of their lot it was annette who met and tried to cheer him she had ever something ready for him were it only a bowl of fresh figs and the earnest child at last became the confidant of the despairing man one memorable evening he returned later than usual and to annette's surprise and pleasure his eyes were bright and shining and he carried his head proudly and with confidence tenderly embracing annette he cried at last at last i have prevailed on these neighbors who hate and yet fear the spanish all is ready and to-morrow we at least will show don ujourna that there are loyal frenchmen enough in louisiana to refuse to live under the spanish flag and his detestable rule but father what is it you would do lean closer my child for none here must learn of this till everything is ready and we leave for the city does mother know dear father no annette i dare not tell her her constant illness makes her timorous the young girl pressed closer to his knee her large serious eyes fixed on his face so wrapped up was the man in his own thoughts that he knew not the heavy burden he was laying on the already overcrowded young shoulders to her the father unfolded his plans well you know the cruel blow that has been dealt to us from france and how the spaniard don antonio has sought to make spaniards of us all true-born frenchmen that we are how he has hoisted the spanish flag and manned all our forts with spanish soldiers to-morrow evening there will be start from this plantation monsieur byron myself and all the owners of the plantations in this parish with such of their men as they can arm and by boat we will go down to the bayou stopping at each plantation as we go and gathering men together till we reach new orleans oh father interrupted annette breathlessly will you take an army into the city so i hope and these with the loyal french guard and the citizens will enable us to sweep onwards and don antonio will find what manner of men he has to deal with and we will not rest till he is safely confined within the walls of belize in the excitement of his story monsieur valvier's voice rose till there came from the room beyond where madame valvier lay the sleepy question as to why they talked so late putting his finger to his lip to warn annette he replied i but tell a tale to annette who will go now to bed kissing her fondly good night he whispered in her ear remember to tell not a word annette and least i do not see you alone again i say farewell till we put the hatred spaniard where he will do no further harm although annette crept to bed her eyes for a long time stared into the darkness she feared not for the success of her father's mission but least in some way he be hurt she saw as he described it don ujourna safely confined in the dreaded belize and she rejoiced in her childish heart 
over the grand part her father was to take in keeping louisiana for the french when the next night came she peeped cautiously out from between the casements and saw dark shadows take their places in the pirogues drawn up at the landing and silently paddled down the bayou she saw her father in the leading boat and with him were several of their own men and in the flaring light of the single torch she saw the gleaming of the guns in a silent adieu she waved her hand even though she knew that her father could not see her and confiding on his belief and assurance of success she fell into a deep and dreamless sleep and over the whole plantation rested an absolute quiet but her father ah the sadness of that night trip the few men who had started with him from the plantation in the hope that they would be joined by many more of wealth and power were cruelly disabused of their beliefs there was but a handful more but in the small group was the spirit of an army and it was hoped that don ujorna could be surprised just before dawn and with the first successful blow many would hasten to join the victorious party it was the old story of a forlorn hope in some way don ujourna had been apprised of the uprising and the party had barely set foot on the levee at new orleans before they were surrounded and taken prisoners by a strong party of spanish soldiers monsieur Vervier, as the leader was not detained in the city but sent up the bayou to fort st john a desolate spot on the shores of lake pontchartrain at the head of the bayou st john during the first two days of his imprisonment monsieur valvier was stunned he seemed incapable of realizing the misfortune which had befallen not himself alone but the little family at home too late he saw that the lukewarm policy of the others whom he had tried to induce to join him was not all selfish and as happened so often to the enthusiast he saw too late the folly of his actions it was the stinging thought of these helpless sufferers at home which at last aroused him and spurred him on to see in their welfare could not be in some way assured the intendant in charge of the fort was hard and cold but as monsieur valvier soon learned was not averse to accepting a ransom indeed he informed monsieur valvier of this fact himself and allowed him to send a letter home telling of his personal safety and that his liberty could be bought till this letter arrived the plantation on the bayou gentilly had been a sad place when as one day after another passed and monsieur valvier did not return annette not knowing what to do told her mother of the uprising and madame valvier with health already undermined became so seriously ill that poor annette knew not which way to turn one or two of the slaves had strayed home and from them annette had learned that at least her father was alive and at last came the letter which told that he could be ransomed if a sufficient sum of money could be raised the letter ended alas dear child i know too well that there is naught left which may be turned into money to procure my freedom i see too late that i have been led away from my duties to my little ones and their mother god grant that they may be kept in safety as for me my heart is breaking madame valvier was too ill to give annette any counsel all day long the child kept saying to herself my father must be ransomed but how where shall i get the gold oh mamma if you could but help me at last passing through the children's room while waiting on her mother annette's eyes fell upon the boards which concealed the leaden-lined box containing the papers and necklace the pearl necklace she cried softly to herself why have i not thought of it before removing the cover she felt hurriedly within the enclosure to assure herself that it was safe the rest of the day as she went about her duties her one thought was of the way to get it to her father and at last she decided that she must go with it herself there was no one whom she could trust with this price of her father's freedom and her heart was full of the thought of saving him so that there was no room for fear she determined to start that night and used from infancy to management of a boat she did not hesitate as to the means of traveling but her mother 
how to leave her she called the woman from the kitchen an old slave but a faithful one and bade her sleep within the next room so that if madame called she should hear her for said annette see tignan i must go on a message for my father when my mother wakens tell her that i shall soon return remember tignan soon return as soon as it was dark annette took from its hiding place the necklace and as the cool milky globes slipped through her fingers she kissed them saying dear father to think that these may save thy life i remember my mother said that they were never to be parted with save for life or honour perhaps this time it may be both but i cannot tell for a moment she was at a loss how to carry them and then putting them about her neck she snapped the clasp securely and drew over them the waist of her gown which was fashioned to come high in the neck tis the easiest and the simplest way and certainly none would think that such a thing lay beneath my calico frock she kissed the little brothers and sister and bade pierre take good care of them till she should return whispering in his ear i go for father but tell of this to no one till i return and pierre with his wide staring eyes fixed on her face could only say i will promise at the landing annette chose the smallest and the lightest pirogue and with the caution one would have expected from an older and wiser head put in the bottom an extra paddle and a small basket of food she pushed off the little dugout turning its head downstream looked back with confidence saying in her brave young heart shortly i shall return and with my father all night the child floated and paddled down the silent and lonely bayou often terrified by the strange night sounds which came from the swamps and occasionally cheered by the light of glimmering in the window of some of the planters homes on the shore when she was most alarmed she would reassure her little trembling heart by putting her hand on the breast of her frock beneath which lay the necklace and by whispering to herself the beloved name of father the rising sun saw her heading her boat into the small channel which led into bayou st john and it was late afternoon when the weary annette saw frowning before her the rough palisades which enclosed fort st john the soldier on duty could scarcely believe his eyes when the little pirogue came alongside the guai and was still more astonished when with trembling voice annette said sir may i please see the governor the governor why what should the governor do here who are you and what would you with the governor i have business with the governor sir at this reply the man laughed long and loud and poor annette was ready to weep with disappointment and fatigue then remembering that at any rate her father was within those walls she plucked up courage and began again if monsieur the governor is not here is there any great general here the soldier laughed again and said below his breath great general no but the great sir intendant is here if you can do your business with him and there was another burst of laughter as the burly man looked at the slender form standing before him take me to him please said she and she gave one touch to the frock below which lay the precious heirloom as the soldier turned to lead the way within the enclosure ho roguet he called this lady comes on business with monsieur the intendant and poor frightened annette was passed along mid the rude jests of the soldiers till she reached an ante-room to which was attached the small office of the intendant at last a voice said you may enter and annette who between fright and fatigue was ready to weep found herself standing before a man with flashing eyes in a brilliant scarlet and gold uniform who was looking at her with unconcealed interest well child what would you with me and annette raising her head bravely answered i come to ransom my father monsieur davier the intendant frowned and surely the pale child before him in a simple calico gown with empty hands and eyes full of unshed tears hardly seemed able to ransom a bird much less a political prisoner the intendant's voice was harsh and cold as he said ransom means gold child gold or lands 
alas monsieur i have neither said the trembling little girl but i thought perhaps and she drew from its place of concealment the splendid necklace the intendant could scarcely conceal a start how came you by this he asked letting the rich strings glide through his fingers twas the marriage portion of my grandmother in france then of my mother also and was to be mine i will give it to you for my father monsieur valvier the sight of the jewels recalled to the intendant scenes in his native spain where the spanish grandees loved to ruffle its laces and jewels of the choicest description and where the dusky spanish beauties often chose pearls since these milky gems but served to throw out the fire of their eyes and the rich tones of their olive skins as he mused passing the pearls between his fingers poor annette was torn with anxiety lest the necklace should fall short of the ransom desired oh monsieur is it not enough she cried one trembling hand holding the other we have naught else my mother is ill i came alone and the tears so bravely held back now fell in showers the intendant had no idea of giving up the necklace yet was not wholly cruel so striking on a bell he called to the orderly who answered it bring valvier hither the sound of the words caused annette to wipe her eyes and in a moment with a scream of joy she rushed into the arms of her father whose wonder at her presence froze the words on his lips monsieur valvier said the intendant you are free the ransom provided by your daughter is sufficient but you must give me your parole that you will never again bear arms against the spanish flag and that you will accept regulations as spain deems best for her colonies i give my parole answered monsieur valvier but annette ransom what had you poor child annette's face was wreathed in smiles as she whispered in his ear the pearl necklace dearest father End of section 7、section 8 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. Dicey Langston, 1787. There was a pleasant, mellow glow in the great low ceiled kitchen, and the absolute quiet was unbroken save for an occasional crackling of the sticks which made a bright fire on the hearth. Yet if the room was still, it was because Dicey chose it so. And as she stood beside the huge wheel which a few moments before had been whirling merrily, she looked with thoughtful eyes at the fire. Now, to tell the truth, Dicey did not like to be alone, nor was it usual for her to be silent. The everyday Dicey was singing if she was not talking, or spinning if she was not busy about the house, or flying here and there on errands for her father, or hunting up the brothers to do this or that. To play or ride or come to meals or something. For Dicey was quite a little queen, as a girl with five big brothers has a right to be. A father and five big brothers, but no mother. Poor little girl. And she had grown to be sixteen years old, the pet of her brothers and the darling of her father's heart, and as you may guess, somewhat spoiled and self willed. Yet I would not have you think for a moment that she was selfish, for she was not so, but she had grown to depend very much on herself and to decide for herself many questions which other girls who had mothers to turn to would have left with them. Dicey's father was no longer a young man, indeed, he was almost past middle life when ten years before he had left his home near Charleston, shattered in spirit by the death of his wife. And gone to the up country, as the northern part of the state of South Carolina was called, and started life anew. Dicey hardly remembered the old home at all. Her thoughts and her affections were all centered about the comfortable home in whose kitchen she now stood, and over whose comfort she reigned. 
she stood for many minutes as we saw her first quite motionless and then as the evening air brought to her ear a sound so slight that you or i might not have noticed it she ran to the window and looked out the house stood in the centre of a clearing on the top of a gentle ridge and flowing out on either hand were dales and hills still covered with the forests through which the hunters and cow drivers had wandered years before through this country the catawbas and the cherokees roamed and but a short distance from the little settlement of which solomon langston's house was a part lay that well-known indian trail called the cherokee path which led from the cherokee country on the west to the lands of the catawbas on the east on the flat lands below the hills stretched wide plains destitute of trees and rich in fine grass and gay with flowers here roamed the buffalo elk and deer here also were wild horses in many a herd and it was from one of these wandering bands of horses that dicey's own little pony had been captured by brother tom before he had married and went to live at elder settlement across the tiger river a deep and boisterous stream between which and the enori lay the plantation where dicey's father had made his home all this time she had been standing at the window looking out over a landscape which lay clear and white before her in the moonlight the slight sound which had caught her ear was getting louder every moment and at last two figures came into view her father and one of her brothers who had ridden early that morning to the settlement ninety six to hear the latest tidings about the war and to gain some news regarding the revolutionary movement which hitherto had been largely confined to the southern portion of the state for dicey it had been a long and weary day her father's last words were let no one know where we have ridden dicey for in such days as these it is best to keep one's own counsel and you know little daughter that most of our neighbours belong to the king's party and dicey had remembered even though eliza gordon had come over that afternoon with her sewing and the two girls had worked on their new kerchiefs faggoting and stitching and edging them with mignonette lace which eliza's mother had brought from charleston when last she went to town such silence was hard enough for dicey who was used to tell whatever thoughts came into her mind particularly to eliza who was her very dearest friend when mr langston had dismounted and dicey had taken one look into his face she cried out oh father is the news bad i can see by your face it is none of the best is that cruel king overseas never going to stop his taxing shall i throw out the tea shush dicey my girl remember what i told you this morning there are none others about us who think as we do and it behooves us to be careful both in what we say and do as he spoke he drew dicey into the house and henry followed the horses having been taken to the stables by one of the slaves who like dicey had heard the sound of the riders and come forward to meet them once within doors dicey forgot for a moment her eagerness for news and ran forward to stir up the fire which had fallen low while she mused and to light the candle which hung from its iron bracket on the back of her father's chair she set the little kettle on the arm of the crane to boil and put close at her father's elbow his long clay pipe and box of tobacco then brought out a tray with glasses and a generous bowl into which she put spices and lemon together with sugar and a measure of wine which she poured from a jug which was fashioned in the form of a fat old man with a very red face and a blue coat kneeling on the hearth she watched to see the steam come from the kettle's nose and as it seemed all long to her impatient spirit she cast another billet of wood upon the dancing flames come come little daughter her father said henry and i have ridden far and your impatience does but delay matters in truth i am so weary and chilled that i am thirsting for the spiced wine which your treatment of the fire does but delay now dicey seized the poker and hastily endeavoured to make up for her error in putting on the new log the only effect of her efforts being to make henry laugh and take the poker from her hand while he said 
Keep the little patriot quiet, father, since if a watched pot never boils, this one is like to stay ever simmering. Mr. Langston held Dicey's hand and all fixed their eyes on the kettle. As the first slender trickle of steam came from its nose, Dicey caught it from the iron arm and soon had two fragrant glasses of hot wine ready for the travellers. Now, father, she said, as she seated herself at his knee, now, father, the news. Tis true, Dicey, that at Gowen's fort many of our people have been horribly murdered. Oh, father, not by Indians, cried the girl, who well knew what this would mean. By worse than Indians, answered Mr. Langston, by white men painted as Indians, who were even more cruel than the savages, if that can be. Dicey sprang to her feet and turned to her brother. Do you know if Bloody Bates had anything to do with this, Henry? Yes, he was the leader. And it is said that he boasted that his next raid should be in the country of the Enori, where he said, dwelt so many fat wigs. Just let him come this way, cried Dicey, and he will find that the fat wigs are ready for him. Even though the case was grave enough, Henry and his father could not forbear a smile at the thought of Dicey, little Dicey, setting up as a match for the cruel bully who had made himself such a terror to the countryside by his midnight marauderings and treacherous killings that he had come to bear the name of Bloody Bates. But Dicey, even though she was a girl, had a secret, and what was stranger yet, she kept it. But in her brave little heart she resolved that if it were possible, she would make it serve her friends. So the next day she went forth in the afternoon carrying her work with her. Henry, who saw her start, little dreaming of the plans in that curly head, called out in a loud, cheerful voice, I wager I know what is in that bag, Dicey, a new frock for Dolly made in the latest mode. But Dicey, see that it be not of red, since our enemies are far too partial to that colour to suit me. No such foolishness as you think, brother. I am to finish my kerchief, which Eliza and I have been sewing on these three or four days. Maybe it will be all done when I come home. Dicey hurried on, almost afraid that she would let out the secret if Henry talked much longer about dolls. Dolls, indeed! Why, she hadn't looked at one for years. Eliza saw her coming and ran to meet her. Come within doors, said Eliza, when their greetings were over, drawing Dicey with her. But this did not suit our little patriot's plans at all. And holding back, she said, Let's go and sit in the tree seat, Eliza. Tis so pleasant out of doors today, and then, you know, we can talk over things there. Go you there, and I will come when I get my reticule, answered Eliza, who, like Dicey, was glad to escape from the keen eyes of mother and elder sister, neither of whom had much sympathy for overlong stitches or puckered work. Dicey did as she was bid and climbed into the tree seat where for years the children had been used to play and now that they had grown older to which retreat they took their sewing or a book though these latter came to hand rarely enough the Bible and some books of devotion being thought quite enough reading for young people in those days. When both girls were comfortably seated and thimbles and needles were ready Dicey fetched a great sigh. "'What's the matter with you, Dicey? "'Have you aught ailing you?' "'No,' said Dicey. "'Nothing very much. "'I was wondering if, when this horrible war was ended, "'you and I should ever go to some great city like Charleston or Fredericksburg, "'as did your sister Miriam. "'Think of it, Eliza, to go to some great town "'where there are many houses and carriages and a playhouse "'and, best of all, balls.' At this magic word, Dicey tossed into the air the little kerchief, and ere it fell, was on the ground holding the skirts of her calico frock, bowing and smiling to an imaginary partner, now towing this way and that, as if she were going through the dance. Though, to tell the truth, the little minx had never seen anything of the kind, but had got her information from Eliza's sister Miriam. 
all of miriam's knowledge had been acquired in safer and happier days when she had made a visit to fredericksburg and astonished the young girls on her return with marvellous tales of what she had seen and heard and the gaieties she had taken part in dicey and eliza had often practised in secret and though their steps would not have passed muster in a drawing-room they had furnished them with pleasure for many an hour oh dicey come up again if mother sees you she would make us come right away into the house you know that she thinks that such things as dancing but waste the time of young maids like you and me thus urged dicey with a sigh took up the sewing again and sat once more beside eliza in the tree but her thoughts were flying all about and eliza spoke twice ere dicey noticed what she said when father comes home to-night he brings with him colonel williams the remark seemed simple enough but a sudden light flooded dicey's mind coming home echoed she why you told me a day or two since that he would not be home till after harvest yes but things have come about differently answered eliza with an important air my father has been in a great battle and he's coming with colonel williams to stay for a day or two till captain bates gets here too captain bates do you mean bloody bates asked dicey pale with horror my father says that is but a whig name for him and that he's done good service to the king in subduing pestilent whigs answered eliza bridling and secretly pleased at the easy way the long words tripped from her tongue that awful cruel man coming here and dicey half looked round to see if the mere speaking of his name had not brought upon the scene one of the most cruel bandits who under the name of scout had wrought endless cruelties in a moment the importance of the information had shot into her mind if she could find out something more sure whatever eliza knew were easy enough to learn also comes he here to rest too and at your house eliza if eliza had given a thought to the low voice and shaking hands of her friend she might have paused ere she told news which was of the greatest importance to such whig families as lived in the neighbourhood and more particularly to those who dwelt in the elder settlement on the other side of the river and were entirely unprotected among them was dicey's eldest brother with his young wife and little family comes he here to rest too and eliza proud of her information and entirely forgetting that she had been told to impart it to no one answered briskly no but he stops here to meet some of the soldiers who go with him and only think tis at our house that they will paint themselves just like the cherokees at the mere thought eliza clapped her hands think how comical they will look she went on while every moment dicey felt herself getting colder and colder with fear and sister miriam has done naught but scurry about and turn things topsy-turvy it's captain bates this and captain bates that till one feels ruffled all the wrong way you know i told you that he was coming here one day and you laughed and said he dare not yes dicey remembered this was the secret she had withheld thinking that like enough it was but some of miriam's boasting that the savage man should seek her at her home it was true however and like to be soon how was she dicey to warn those who were so unprotected thinking more deeply than ever she had thought before eliza babbled on her silent companion taking no note of what she said well dicey if you cannot listen to what i say and not even answer me i shall go into the house besides my kerchief is all done and mother told me to bring it to her when the stitches were all set how does it become me as she spoke eliza threw it about her round white throat and tossed her head the exact copy of sister miriam but dicey was too absorbed to notice her companion's small frivolities 
Her thoughts were solely on how to get word to her brother of the impending arrival of bloody baits in the neighborhood. Fears for the safety of her own home were not wanting, since Henry, the only brother left at the old homestead, was but waiting the summons to go and join the command of Colonel Hugh Middleton. As Dicey walked slowly home along the bridle path which served for a road in that sparsely settled region, her mind had not thought of any plan by which her message was to be sent to her brother and his friends. Yet, over and over, the words formed themselves in her brain. They must be told, they must be told. Her father was feeble, and these years of anxiety and of hard work since his sons had been called away from home to bear their share of hardships in the war, to which there seemed no end, had enfeebled him still more. From him the news must be kept at any risk. Perhaps Brother Henry would go. But while this thought passed through her mind, she saw him coming through the wood on his horse. I have ridden this way to tell you good-bye, little sister. Even now word was brought that I must join my company. Come hither. And as Dicey ran to his side, he bent down, saying, Set thy foot on my stirrup. I have that to say which must not be spoken aloud. As Dicey did as he bade her, and stood poised on his stirrup leather, holding tightly to his hand, he whispered in her ear, Be brave, little sister, and take the best care of father. He is ill and weak, and it vexes me sorely to leave such a child as you with no one stronger to protect you. Yet go I must, and I trust that before long Thomas may come for you and my father, or that Batty will return. As Dicey looked into her brother's troubled face, the thought that he must not be told rushed upon her. Go he must, and they must take such care of themselves as they could. So she leaned forward and said as cheerfully as possible, Never fear for us, brother. There's no danger for father and me, for sure none would attack an old man and a young maid. See, I'm not in the least afraid. I could leave you with a better heart if I thought that were the truth. Yet even as we have spoken, thy cheeks have grown as white as milk, and see, your hand trembles like a leaf in the wind. Dicey pulled away that tell-tale member and jumped down from the horse. When the time comes, I'll prove as good a soldier as any of the Langston boys. Rest you assured of that, she cried. Farewell, then, Brother Dicey. And Henry tried to cheer her by making her smile, then with his own face set in a look far too grave for one so young, he rode down the path in the flickering light, little dreaming of the desperate resolution which was forming in the mind of his sister. As she got the supper ready and talked brightly, as was her wont with her father, she had decided that she must be the one to take the news across to Brother Tom at the Elder Settlement, and, oh dear, oh dear, she must go this very night, for who could tell perhaps Bloody Bates would stop there on his way, for she knew not which direction he was coming from. Yet for her father's sake, she was as much like her own cheerful self as she could be, and she forced herself to eat, as the way would be long and difficult. Twice she almost gave way to tears in the safe shelter of the pantry, Yet do not blame my little Dicey, for though she felt fear, she never once thought of giving up her mission. When her duties for the night were all done, and the hot coals of the fireplace carefully covered, so that a few chips of light wood would set them blazing in the morning, Dicey sat down and tried to think out how she should manage. Her father was sleeping in his great chair by the fireplace, and he looked so worn and old that she resolved to take on her slender shoulders the whole responsibility. Perhaps it was her steadfast gaze, or perhaps it was his thoughts which wakened Mr. Langston with a start, caused him to look around and ask, Where is Henry? Why, father dear, Henry rode forth this afternoon to join Colonel Middleton. You've been napping, I think. True, Dicey, I did but dream. Tis late enough for an old man like me, 
so light the candle and I'll to bed. As she handed the rude candlestick to him, Dicey threw her arms about his neck and swallowed hard to keep the tears that were so close to the surface from welling over. Why, child, what ails thee? One would think that I was to start on a journey too, whereas all I can do is to bide at home. And Mr. Langston heaved a deep sigh as he said it. Brother Henry bid me take care of you, and I mean to, dearest father. Since you've sent five sons to this cruel war, it seems as if it might be that you and I were left at peace. Yes, yes, daughter, I do but pray that I may live to see all my brave boys come home to me once more. With bowed head, Mr. Langston took his way to the small chamber opening off the living room. Now, thought Dicey, must I plan and act. First, I will write a few lines to Father, lest he think that I too have followed Brother Henry. She hunted about for a fragment of paper, a thing not too common in a frontier farmhouse. Then she dashed some water into the dried-up inkhorn and mended a pen as well as she could. Will you think any the less of her if I tell you that Poor Dicey was a wretched penman. Her days at school had been very few, since the nearest one was at ninety-six, and her father could ill spare his little housekeeper. Yet he had taught her a bit, and as she sat and wrote by the flaring rushlight, I am afraid that her tongue was put through as much action as her pen. Poor Dicey! The little billet which caused her so much labor was intended to allay her father's anxiety, as well as to let him know where she had gone. Of the object of her mission, there was never a word. That she would tell him on her return. The little scrawl was set on the table with one end beneath the candlestick, where he would be sure to see it in the morning. Dear father, it began, I go to carry a message to brother Tom. I leave early in the morning, and I will return as soon as might be. There's naught to fear for me, your loving Dicey. Tis better, she mused half aloud, to say morning, than to have him think that I was forced to go at night, lest I fall into the hands of some of these bandits on their way here. But I must not think of that. I must be off as soon as I can get ready, and the faster I work, the less afraid I am. She hurriedly put some food in a packet and then crept up the stairs to her own tiny room under the eaves. You would hardly have known her when she came softly down a few moments later. Her hair was bound and knotted close to her head, for well she knew how the bushes and trees would catch the flowing curls. Her stuff gown was kilted high and held securely in place while on her feet she had drawn a pair of boots which were her brother Batty's, and though large, they were stout and strong and came nigh to her knees. A heavy shawl covered her shoulders and was tied behind, and into the front of it she thrust the packet of food. As she went softly out of the door, she gave a last look toward her father's room, and then hastened on, anxious to give her warning and then hurry home. Dicey knew the way well, having been to visit her brother a number of times, but in her haste and excitement she had not thought that a path by day with company is a very different thing from the same path by night and alone. Yet this did not daunt her, even though there were strange noises in the forest and elfin fingers seemed to reach out from the bushes and pluck at her as she tried to hurry on. Each twig which snapped as she trod on it brought her heart uncomfortably to her mouth in a way she did not like at all. The woods were bad enough, but infinitely worse were the marshes where there was not even a foot log, much less a bridge to take her over the worst places, and but for Batty's boots she would have suffered cruelly from roots and stones. Still she pressed bravely on. She gripped her hands and kept repeating, "'Every step takes me nearer,' Every step takes me nearer, till it made itself into a kind of tune. She dared not think that the worst was yet to come, and that the Tiger River, with its brawling current, had still to be crossed. 
when at last she heard a faint murmuring it seemed to give her new strength and she turned in that direction just as the first gleams of dawn lighted the sky she stood on the muddy banks of the river she looked about her in the dim light and thought that she recognized the place as the ford where they usually crossed so quite exhausted she threw herself upon the ground saying to herself i will rest a few moments and take a bite of pone for well i know that the water of the tiger is deadly cold and muddy too as she thought she acted and in a brief time rose to her feet not with that springy lightness which was customary with her but slowly and with effort the long hard walk the chafing of the boots which were too large for her all made her feel stiff and lame as she waded into the water it took all her courage to keep from screaming out in she went a step at a time thrusting one foot before the other to feel her way in the rushing water and bewildered by the grey light and the heavy fog which lay above the water and hid the other shore it seemed to her that the water was getting very deep surely much deeper than when she went through it before though on that occasion she was mounted safely on the back of her little pony oh dear molly if only you were here with me now instead of safe at home in your stall and one or two tears rolled over dicey's cheeks to be immediately swallowed up in the swirling waters which every moment grew deeper around her she went forward step by step never once thinking of turning back and now the wavelets reached her waist and now they were breast high and so heavy that they threatened to draw her from her feet completely bewildered but not quite sure of her course since the opposite bank could not be seen through the low-lying fog dicey lost her track and wandered upstream instead of across she noticed that the water now just below her armpits kept at the same height and fearing that every moment it would grow deep enough to engulf her she stopped a moment in her difficult course and looked about her what was that which she could dimly discern apparently advancing towards her to her mind already overwrought it seemed bloody bates himself as indeed it might have been and with a shriek which she vainly tried to smother she turned abruptly to the left and plunged with all the speed she could muster through the water oh joyful thought the black stream was getting lower it was but breast high now and as she leaped and plunged along with every movement it receded till at last she stumbled on the bank and lay there sobbing with fright and exhaustion she heard a soft swish in the river and hastily raised her head to find that what had so terrified her was a huge buck which was now half swimming and half wading to shore himself cold and wet half dead with fright and fatigue dicey at sight of her supposed enemy laid her head on her arms and had a good cry only a dear she sobbed and then began to laugh and with the laugh feeling better she scrambled to her feet saying to herself tis but two miles to brother tom's and then i am safe the way was easier now for it was a travelled path made by indians it is true and their cruel allies the british but still it was daylight and away from the river the air was clear and fresh too fresh for comfort to the shivering girl who ran and stumbled in her haste to get her message delivered the two miles dragged themselves away at last and through the trees dicey saw the group of rude houses which made the elder settlement and ah there was brother tom already out of doors about his work as soon as dicey saw him she shouted and when he looked up he seized his gun for a weapon lay ever within reach in those days little wonder was it that he did not recognize the small figure which ran towards him waving its arms and shouting words which he did but half catch at the sound of the commotion ellie his wife came to the door and at the first glance cried out why tom it's dicey 
and ran out to meet her, fearful of bad tidings, since it was easy to see that the girl was almost at the limit of her strength. As soon as Tom realized who it was, he ran forward and caught her in his arms and hurried into the house, his lips forming themselves into the one word, Father? Dicey shook her head, and when Tom set her down on the stone hearth, she slipped down into a little wet heap with a pale face and eager eyes. Oh, Brother Tom, she began as soon as she caught her breath. Stay, said Brother. Is aught wrong with father or brothers? No, said Dicey. I came. Then thy news will wait till thou art dry and warm, else we are like to have a dead Dicey instead of a living one. Ellie, take and give her dry clothes, and I will make for her a mug of hot cider which will warm her through and through. From her clothes the tiger seems at flood these days. When Dicey, warm and dry once more, poured out her tale of warning, Tom hurried away to call the men of the settlement together. As the small handful of grave settlers came and heard the news, Dicey felt in their few words of thanks ample payment for what she had undertaken in their behalf. Nor did they hesitate in their course, packing together what possessions were most valued and driving before them the few cattle which remained, they and their families that very afternoon crossed the tiger at the ford which poor Dicey had missed and sought the protection of the fort at ninety-six. The next day Dicey was left at her own home and in the arms of her anxious father. She told her tale to him sitting by his side and holding his hand, for he could hardly realize that his little girl, his Dicey, had been through an experience at which even a man might have hesitated. My child, he said, it seems but yesterday that I held you in my arms, and here you are a woman grown ere I thought it. Fondly stroking her soft hair, he looked into the fire and spoke half to himself. "'Tis like her mother, but a child to look on, yet with a heart of steel. "'Why, father, you think too much of it. "'Twas not so much after all. "'At least it seems so now that once more I am safe at home with you, "'though truly in the doing I was much afeard. "'Looking round as she spoke, she caught sight of the noon mark on the window, "'and jumping up exclaimed, "'Why, father,' Here have we sat gossiping till it is nearly midday, and not a thing made ready for dinner. Shame on me for a bad housekeeper. And with that she bustled away to prepare the simple meal which was the daily fare of many a family living far from the towns. A pudding made of the white corn meal did not take long to stir together, and in a pot was soon stewing some bits of venison from the last deer which Henry had shot, part of which had been salted down for their winter supply. A portion of the pudding, with a pinch of salt added, and baked on a hot iron shovel with a long handle, served instead of bread, and what was left would answer for their supper, with some of the cheese in the making of which Dicey was well skilled. There was always plenty of milk from their small herd of cattle. After all had been settled for the afternoon, the trenches washed and the pewter cups polished and set on their shelves, Dicey drew out her wheel and set herself at her spinning. The low whirr and the comfortable ditty, which Dicey hummed hardly above her breath, set her father to dozing in his chair, and neither of the occupants of the kitchen was prepared for the crashing knock which came on the heavy door. Before Dicey could reach it, to set it open, a harsh voice cried out, if you open not that door, and quickly, we'll smoke out all of you. Dicey drew back, looking at her father for counsel. Draw the bolt, child, he said. We have no strength to withstand them. Our very weakness must be our protection. Dicey pulled back the great oaken bar, which served as a lock, and in pushed half a dozen men heavily armed, none of whom she'd ever seen before. "'So, the wig cub is gone, has he?' asked the one man, who seemed the leader, a tall man dressed in buckskin trousers of Indian make, over which the red coat of the British officer seemed odd enough. 
"'It is true that my son has gone forth to serve his country,' said Mr. Langston in a quiet voice. At the reply which seemed to enrage the ruffian, he strode a step forward, cocking his pistol as he advanced. "'I'll show him how to serve his country when I find him. "'And as for you, old man, long enough have you hampered the king's service.' He pointed the weapon at Mr. Langston, when with a cry Dicey threw her arms about her father's neck, and shielding him with her body called out over her shoulder, "'Coward, shoot now if you dare!' Bloody Bates, for indeed it was he, raised his pistol once more, and with a wicked skull was preparing to fire, when one of the men who had stood silently by till now knocked up the weapon, saying, as long as the cub we came for has fled, let us on, Bates. We have no war with dotards and children. The others murmured surly assent, and bidding Dicey and her father beware how they harboured traitors, the whole party withdrew. It took Dicey scarce a moment to fly to the door and bar it, and then hurry back to her father, who was lying back in his chair, pale with the excitement and the peril which they had undergone and only too thankful that one among the company had respected his grey hairs and Dicey's youth. For many a day they lived in hourly fear of their lives, even after Bloody Bates had taken himself off on his raids and the neighbourhood was comparatively peaceful. Did Dicey undergo any more special perils, you ask? Yes, once again she faced grave danger, being met by a scouting party as she was coming from a trip to the nearest town. They questioned her as to the whereabouts of her brothers and other Whigs in the vicinity, but she refused to tell what she knew. The leader threatened to shoot her, but she faced him bravely, crying, Well, here I am, shoot, opening her neckerchief at the same time. He was ashamed, apparently, for the band rode on, leaving her to make her way home. She lived to see all her brothers but one return from their duties in the army, and by her loving care and devotion made her father's life a happy one. She was only a little southern girl, living in a lonely spot and long since dead, but her courageous acts live on and shine, as do all good deeds in a naughty world. End of section 8 Recording by Jean.